Hello, everyone. Welcome to Cave of the Cross Apologetics. I'm Patrick. And I'm Tony. And we're in the midst of Chapter 18, Calling People to Encounter God in Jesus Christ, which is our look at the fetus position of the six apologetic questions that uh, all apologists have to answer. Covered the first three, uh, dealing with Scripture, uh, how do we know uh, uh, that uh, uh, Christianity is the only way, and um, how, uh, can we prove that God exists? And so we've covered uh, from from Martin Luther to Kierkegaard to Barth and uh, seen what they had to say. And so now we're going to cover the the final three of, of this one uh, before we uh, do our, our summaries uh, and, and critiques in the, probably the next couple episodes. And so uh, this chapter, uh, we're in the middle of chapter 18 here, and uh, we've done the first three. So now the fourth one is the personal problem of evil. So how does the fetus deal with this idea of the problem of evil? Well, the problem of evil is one of the most famous puzzles in human history of, of human thought. For fetus, this is, uh, that is exactly what the problem is with the problem of evil. It is treated as an intellectual puzzle, a kind of apologetical Rubik's Cube, uh, which is um, a, 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 an evil Rubik's Cube, which is pretty much what a Rubik's Cube is for those that don't know the, uh, the equation to, uh, to, to solve it. So uh, I, can, I can see the analogy. The real issue, they say, is whether people will trust God. When people ask about how God can be all powerful and all loving and still allow evil, the unvoiced question they are always almost asking is how can I trust God and why should I trust God? Right. Right. So the problem of evil boils down to do I trust God, right? He's in control. He's the creator. Uh, and so, uh, you know, do I trust him? And that's the issue that they they uh, they want us to see here. So fetus, our authors tell us, typically answer this question in two ways. First, they argue that, uh, in a sense, the question is inappropriate and shows that people have not really come to terms with what it means for God to be God. So in other words, you know, asking a question about, you know, evil and that sort of thing is really inappropriate because of who God is, right? According to Kierkegaard, for instance, it is unthinkable to blame God <clears throat> for anything. And no proof of his goodness, he Kierkegaard tells us, is needed. Uh, for this reason, Christianity cannot answer the question why, for in the absolute sense, why cannot be asked. And so the absolute is the absolute. Right. So, you know, what kind of question is this? Right. God is in control. He is the creator. And, uh, you know, and so it's really inappropriate to ask these types of questions. Likewise, our authors tell us that Barth held that, uh, for instance, God gave Job no answer to the problem of suffering, but simply asked Job to, and here it is, trust him. Right. He says God does not ask for Job's understanding and agreement or applause he just asked for his trust. Right, right. And so we could say, yes, of course, he doesn't give Job an answer. And that's probably uh, one of the themes and, and, and lessons that we can give for Job. But when it comes to Joseph, it seems like there is an answer to the problem of suffering and evil that happens uh, with uh, Genesis 50. Uh, so it seems like there are times when we do actually get an answer. So um, uh, we need to understand the whole the whole view of scripture there well okay that was the first one but second and and in some tension with the claim that no answer should be given to the problem some vita, fetus do offer a reply to the question of why we should trust god to wit in christ's suffering and death god has shown his trustworthiness beyond anything we have the right to have expected barth takes the answer one step further and says that rather than trying to justify God to the unbelieving world by uh, constructing speculative, rational arguments, the church needs to show in its own response to human suffering that it is a people who know and trust God. So this is this is kind of interesting, right? So this kind of second aspect here is that, um, you know, one that I think we could uh, uh, at least to a certain extent grapple, you know, hold on to, right? The answer is in Christ's suffering, right, and death. So in that, God has shown that he is trustworthy, mm -hmm. that he is accomplishing his purposes, and that he is working things out for good, right? And so that's, uh, you know, so that's, that's uh, I would say that's at least, uh, you know, a good answer. There would be something similar to what we've seen. It's a the theodicy, right? It gives uh, that... Uh, you know, God is kind of working these things out. It's it's uh, 
and he's accomplishing his purposes and he's going to use evil the death and suffering of Christ for good, right? So we can make the same claim with regard to when things happen in our life. And so we just trust him. He's working on something. And then this other further step our authors tell us about, you know, um, that uh, the response to human suffering is that people, uh, you know, should, uh, should know and trust God because the church needs to show that they know and trust God. Right. That's an answer to the problem of, yeah. uh, of evil. And, and that's what we did see kind of with that social gospel movement that kind of I, I don't want to blame all I'll blame on Barth. But, you know, it's probably not outside the room possibility to do so. Uh, that that social gospel aspect, uh, uh, it just seemed to be more so the focus on on it, uh, where the church goes out into the world and does things and not trying to discount that uh, we we shouldn't be uh, social changers in the world and, and, and helpful. Uh, but when that becomes the sole focus is, is uh, we, we lose the message of, of exactly why we do it. And so, um, yeah, I, I think that's, uh, that's uh, uh, and, uh, a, a part of the answer, I think. Yeah, yeah, it's helpful. It's yeah. helpful. All right, All right so, so that's problem the problem of evil. Of evil right? Solved. Solved yeah. once again. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the next major question has to do with miracles, right? And so our authors uh, call this section miracles as God revealing himself. And so they tell us that the fetus approach to miracles may be understood by comparing it to the approach taken in Reformed apologetics, right? Mm. So in, if, in Reformed apologetics, the biblical miracles are problematic to non-Christians because they do not accept the Bible as God's self-attesting revelation. For Reformed apologists, revelation is essentially verbal. God communicates truth to us in a proposition of form. And included in this truth is the fact that God has done certain miracles for our redemption. And so the apologetic task then becomes to present God's revelation in Scripture as his self-attesting word. And uh, belief in the biblical miracles then will follow. Right, So we say God... Um, does this to kind of reveal himself to us and so uh and, and and so that's why we see these various miracles he's accomplishing things in the world right yep and and so you know uh the along with the reformed apologist you know you you show an unbeliever the party in the red sea again or people rising from the dead or uh, uh healing of paralytics or you know what have you um, there's always the ability to explain their way. Now, some people do believe, but even look at the, the time and place uh, uh, that, uh, the, that happens in Jesus' story. You, you would think that, you know, the, the apostles are making this up. They're writing this down. They, they, they um, write about how, uh, you know, uh, Jesus uh, fed, fed the, the, the thousands um, uh, twice. And uh, then he goes and, and tells them about um, the, the bread of life and um, his blood and most people go away. Well, why would they write that and not just, well, he performed all these miracles and they believed and they followed after him and we're the, the progeny of, of, of that belief. And so uh, the, the miracles are hard to, to establish as proof because um, it, it's, it, it doesn't always result in, in that um, changed mind. And so it, it seems like there has to be more than just the miracle and the miracles seem to have um, uh, maybe a belief purpose to some, uh, but not always to all. In fact, um, one of the um, uh, uh, big uh, miracle claims of uh, it, within um, the scope of, of Jesus's uh, death, resurrection, and and uh, rising again there um, is the destruction of Jerusalem. Right. Uh, so he he talks about how um, the, the 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 people of the city will will. Um, face judgment for ex exactly what they're doing uh, to him and what uh, befalls upon him. And so in AD 70, uh, you know, Jerusalem is sacked and, and uh, people are spread out and, uh, you know, the Sadducees and the Pharisees lose their political power, the temple's destroyed, and the gospel goes forth and grows more until the point in time when it overtakes Rome and becomes the, the, the ruling religion of Rome. So uh, it seems uh, like uh, miracles don't have quite the punch that uh, non-believers kind of want it to, to see, you know, oh, if I, if I saw someone's paralyzed hand, uh, or, or, or uh, um, uh, cut off hand, uh, grow back, then, then I would believe. 
I, I don't know if that's always the case. I don't know if, if that, uh, that uh, you know, I, I would believe my own lying eyes uh, type deal would, would happen. <laughs> Well, the fetus uh, approach differs in this respect from uh, the reform apologists. For them, God's revelation is not essentially verbal, but active. It is what God does, particularly in Jesus Christ, that reveals God to us. Of course, part of what God does in Christ is to speak, and fetus do not deny that revelation includes a verbal aspect. But the point is this. In fetism, one does not believe in the reality of miracles because God has revealed that they have happened. Rather, one believes because in those very miracles, one realizes that God is revealing himself. In Reformed apologetics, miracles are believed because God reveals them. In fetism, because in them, God reveals himself. So, so, so it's just kind of the opposite, right? right? Miracles are believed because God reveals that, you know, what he's, what, uh, what, he, uh, what they are, right? He reveals them in his, in his word for Reformed apologetics. But for fetism, right? Uh, they they're believed because God is revealing uh, Himself, right? So in the miracle, God reveals Himself, right? As opposed to God reveals the miracle, mm -hmm. right? So it's kind of the the, uh, the other side of the coin, we might say. Right. Right. Yeah. All right. The next question has to do with Jesus Christ, right? And um, and so uh, Jesus, the Christ of faith, is what our authors want us to see with <laughs> fetism in this particular section. So fetus believe that Jesus Christ needs no defense, right? They believe he is personally self-attesting. As people encounter Jesus Christ through the witness of the scripture and the church, they are one to faith in him by the power of the love and grace of God that he embodies. And so to question, why should I believe in Jesus Christ? The fetus would simply answer, well, get to know him and you'll see, right? Right. <laughs> right? Yeah. Why should I believe that your wife exists? Well, come meet her <laughs> and get to know her. Right? Yeah, get, a, get a good meal out of it. And <laughs> yeah. Good conversation. Yeah. 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 Right. I don't know. I don't know. There's something about this woman that uh, <laughs> makes me think that uh, they they're, they might be living together. Yeah. <laughs> well, although fetus oppose traditional sorts of arguments designed to prove or defend the rationality that Jesus is the risen Christ and the Son of God, they do employ indirect arguments in keeping with Kierkegaard's practice of indirect communication. For example, Kierkegaard's philosophical fragments, uh, Kremlis' poem about God becoming a man in order to be our teacher and savior is shown not to be the Clematis' uh, invention or the creation of any other human being. It must, therefore, to have come from God himself. Which again, harkens back to uh, uh, the the Christian message is is so bizarre, so so uh, different than uh, what you see from other religions that it must be true, right? Those who hear the story of the incarnation and disbelieve it are always offended at the absurdity of it, a fact that he takes as direct indirect confirmation of its truth. So it's so absurd that it has to be true. It's so other, it's so different than what we would expect and what we would come up with that shows that it's true, right? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of an indirect argument is what and, they're and, suggesting. And, and that people respond to it as such. Like, oh, right. that, that that's so weird. That's so bizarre. Uh, you know, it's offensive to me. Well, hold on. What, why, why are you offended by, by that story? If, it, if that's all it is, you know, uh, you, you, you don't read Homer's uh, Iliad and Odyssey and just throw the book and say, uh, how, how can the gods treat uh, Odysseus this way? This is absurd. Even though Odysseus kind of had to come into him a little bit too, because uh, the hubris uh, of, of, of declaring to the gods that he would see his wife soon and uh, maybe not so much. <laughs> Right. Yeah. So we also see this kind of indirect argument in Barth as well. He argues that Jesus Christ must be the person attested in Scripture because no human being could ever have invented the story. Right. <clears throat> Excuse me. And also, uh, according to Barth, it makes no sense for someone who believes in uh, Christ as the truth to try and prove or defend that belief. And so Barth is content then simply to present Jesus Christ as he has revealed himself to us and to explain what Christians believe about Christ. So he just presents Christ, right? But without this trying to prove who he is and that sort of thing. Ultimately, you know, Jesus Christ by the spirit is the one who convinces us and others that he is who he claims to be. 
right? And so that's kind of what Bark is suggesting here. Yeah. Which again seems there's there's a little bit of uh, of of like uh, ultra Calvinism in here where it's just like well you know the people who will believe are the ones that God will speak to and they're just going to be the ones that believe um, you know and and that almost devalues the sense of, of of evangelism but we see evangelism both in Scripture and in in the the wide variety of church history whether Calvinism or not Calvinism um, but uh, but it seems here that it. Uh, it's it's almost uh, not so much of you. It's just of the of the spirit convincing you that that exists. And uh, well, there, well, there, may, there may be that uh, duality uh, of work in there. Yeah, well, it definitely for the fetus devalues uh, philosophical argumentation, right, right. right? Which is what they're trying to get away from. Sure, exactly. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. Well. Those are the six questions. So we covered three in this one and three previously, which you can see in the, the last episode. And uh, now we go on to uh, the summary of kind of, all right, what, what did we learn from all this? Uh, you know, what, what did they say? And then our authors talk about the positives and the negatives, which uh, again, they've always been fair with. And uh, you might not always view the negatives as negatives as uh, uh, we may have uh, uh, alluded to in our last one. Um, but uh, but it's always interesting to, to take a look at, to see, uh, exactly what's offered um, um, uh, on, on both sides of the issue. So we'll do that in the next episodes. And then from there, we'll see uh, if our authors uh, have anything new to bring to the table. And maybe we can add a fifth one to the out of the four. So, All right. So that's what we'll be doing next time. Again, you can always find the short clips uh, to this episode, which is just uh, segmented out things so that you can um, respond or uh, view it in in its uh, in its uh, the simplest form uh, in the short clips, and it helps people with the attention span of teenagers today uh, to <laughs> to view things. Well, I, it's probably actually more middle aged people now because teenagers have less of the attention span. So, uh, so uh, we we offer these clips up uh, um, for for purposes of uh, it's for people that are busy. Right? Yeah, exactly. That's what it is. Yeah, yeah, you, you don't want to so listen they, to oh, that's right. Yeah, a, a twenty minute episode. This, this is this is terrible. So we, we need it at six minute intervals. Yeah, and those are released throughout the week. So we we give the people what they need. There you go. All right. Uh, so we'll see you next time. And uh, thanks for joining us. See you next time.